All right, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the presentation that I think they can hear me. This is the presentation that uh, Fred would have given, and I'm not brave enough to give this particular talk, and I don't know enough about it to do it even if I were. Uh, but I think it's quite interesting. That should be protein confirmation, so I don't know how that happened. Uh, all right, so this kind of reminds me the position I'm in following Sarah Trimpin's very nice talk with all that great data uh, to a paper that uh, we were invited to give uh, or present in a, the International Journal of Mass Spectrometry in honor of John Finn. Um, so Sarah had uh, a, a picture of her with John Finn, and I just don't want to be outdone, so there's me with John Finn, but, and I knew him very well, but I don't think I knew him as well as Sarah did, apparently. So um, <laughs> anyway, the paper, getting back to this paper that we put in, uh, John Finn in his uh, uh, Nobel Prize address had said, uh, making the elephants fly with the electrospray ionization. So we made the comment that uh, we use Trojan horses to make uh, elephants fly, and one of the reviewers really didn't like it, and he said, you are no John Finn, and, and I'm also no Fred McLafferty, so I'm not giving this talk today, and those of you came just to hear that talk, I'm sorry, I have to give a talk that I know something about. This is sort of an extension of what Sarah was talking about, inlet ionization, but I just want to uh, try to set some things straight. Sarah's contribution to this was just simply the idea. The laser and the mass spec and that wooden box and the two adjustments we have, I don't know if you noticed uh, here, but very important is the way you adjust this uh, height of the uh, laser beam. They were from our laboratory, so I have to admit that she did hold the uh, glass plate. But it turns out that we really don't Oh, this is the, uh, just to show the kind of spectra you got early on. And this wasn't originally, it took us a while to get to something this nice. And so with laser spray, we could get lysozyme to fly. Four picomoles applied, uh, four second uh, acquisition to do this. And we were very happy because this is fundamentally very interesting. You get an electrospray-like mass spectrum from a moldy-like process. But we really didn't need the cute girl here. We could use an XY stage. And we didn't need the ion source. It was just getting in the way. So we uh, moved on. <clears throat> and with a little a different matrix than DHB, we used DHAP. And that is quite a, a nice matrix for things like peptides and proteins. And you get a very nice spectrum comparable to what you would see with electrospray ionization of this material. You can even do things like imaging. Sarah talked about this yesterday. Uh, this is from my group. We're doing this at 100,000 resolution using laser spray. And these are of um, lipids that are in the, uh, in the uh, mouse brain tissue. And you can see the images that we're able to get <clears throat> with this. And this was early on, but we couldn't do peptides and proteins. So we needed to improve the ionization method. And I have an NSF grant to do just that. And uh, Nicholas Chubity, who's here, was working on this. And one of the things we wanted to do is get rid of background. You get a lot of background a lot of times. And if you can figure a way to get rid of that, it would help. So this is actually a mixture to, to demonstrate that. It's 90 femtomoles of angiotensin II with five picomoles of uh, polyethylene glycol, a lot of polyethylene glycol. <clears throat> with DHAP, if you did this with DHB, you would only see the, uh, the PEG. But you still see some of the uh, peptide. In MALDI, and this is interesting because everything we do that's been done in MALDI seems to work with this technique. So it, in a way, it's like MALDI. So in MALDI, they add ammonium salt, and uh, Nick decided to do this. And it improves the spectra with uh, things that are less polar. So the most polar things are the ones that uh, become ionized, and the less polar uh, are suppressed. And you can see the spectra over here. You now see the uh, peptide much better. Here's an example now with this magic matrix, the three nitro benzonitrile that Sarah was talking about at the end. 
uh, you can use this as a laser spray matrix. Even though it doesn't absorb the laser energy very well, it nevertheless works quite well. Now we're down to 10 femtomoles of bradykinin producing a nice spectrum without ammonium salt. If you add ammonium salt, it does improve it, as you can see if you look at that, uh, but not a whole lot with this matrix, and much more with DHAP. Here's an example now of if you have a dirty, this is a fairly high concentration of insulin and not by our standards, but if it's a dirty system, you can get lots of uh, various addicts and things, and it doesn't work well. But if you throw in the ammonium salt, you can really clean it up, and you get a very nice spectrum. So ammonium salt works with uh, the laser spray just as it does with moldy. And now we were able finally uh, to begin to uh, image things like small proteins and peptides. And here's an example from a mouse brain in which we were able to get an image from that. Now, I don't want to talk a lot about that. I want to go on and say that we didn't need the girl, we didn't need the source, and we don't even need the laser. You can replace the laser with a gun. So those of you who prefer shooting guns in your laboratory, this is Vince Pignotti, and we have a metal plate. And yesterday, somebody was talking about a hammer. If you hit something with a hammer, you could make ions and see them by mass spec. I'm sure if we hit that plate with a hammer, we'd see mass spectra. On the other side of the plate is the matrix with the analyte in it. And so by doing this, you fire the BB gun, and there's a thing that catches the BB, and he has a shield on, so it's not too dangerous. We get a spectrum like this. This is the shock wave knocking off the material, and you get the spectrum of insulin in this case. So you don't have to do it with a shock wave. You can just simply shovel the stuff into the entrance of the mass spectrometer and get a nice uh, spectrum. Now, I forbid my students for a while to do this technique because it dirtied the instrument when we're using DHB. DHB is f fairly non-volatile. It would get inside, and after a while, it would uh, dirty up this uh, skimmer in the back of this thing and hurt the performance of the instrument. But with DHAP, it's not so bad. That evaporates away. And now with the 3NBN matrix, it goes away immediately. There is no contamination of the instrument. So this turns out to be a pretty good method to do ionization. And we do something very similar to this now with all the samples that come in. Rather than run electrospray, you just simply mix it with 3NBN and you tap it on the entrance and you have your results. So people don't have to go to the trouble uh, of doing that. Now, one of the things, I know you can't see this, but there's a sign, and the reason I put this slide up, it actually is a sign that says, be very careful about how you do electrospray because you could clog the needle. And in our laboratory, that happens quite frequently, uh, and it's a very time-consuming or expense-consuming to repair that. This is much simpler, and without contamination of the instrument, it's a very nice method of doing ionization. Here's examples of doing the May-I technique with DHAP, I believe, and you have insulin and ubiquitin, very nice mass spectra of a mixture. So one of the questions that was asked is the matrix required in inlet ionization, and it actually is not. Um, it's useful, but it's not required. And I'll tell you why it's useful in a minute. <clears throat> this is no matrix, and here we have a drug, and you get a nice... Uh, ion from it and no fragmentation, even though the inlet is above 300 degrees. There's another drug. Same thing. You just tap this stuff in a little. You take a needle and you touch it in the powder and you touch it to the inlet. Now, why don't I want to do this? Because you can contaminate the instrument eventually if you do this. Uh, and it's not very sensitive. But if you have a compound that's just sitting there as a solid state, you could do this and get a, a very nice spectrum of it. And Amazingly, it works with myoglobin. And Sarah suggested water. I don't know. Maybe it's water. It really is, uh, to me, hard to believe that you can take myoglobin powder, touch it on the inlet, it heated, I think, in this case, to 350 or 400 degrees, and you not only see the apomyoglobin, but you see some of the halomyoglobin. Uh, <coughs> but it's not sensitive. So we wanted to study the fundamentals of this process a bit more. And Vince Pegnotti um, made this device with uh, labware. We have a pump that's pumping it, and we have a um, 
electrometer that DuPont was kind enough to throw away and we grabbed it. So what we have is a heated inlet tube, just a tube, and you have a vacuum, and you have a detector, essentially a, a plate, that goes to the electrometer. And if he looks at a whole variety of materials, more than here, you will get ion current down on this detector right here. So you measure an ion current, and sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. Mostly it was positive in the cases that we looked at, but sometimes it just popped over to negative. And in fact, when it was positive, if you change conditions sometimes, you would get negative. And the interesting thing, Vince noticed that you got a lot of ion current with liquids, so he decided to just try this on a mass spec, and he, he took some solvent and he tapped it in <coughs> with analyte, got a spectrum. So inlet ionization didn't require matrix, and it didn't require no matrix. It could work with a liquid, which is quite nice, because the vacuum, this is at lower pressure than out here, you push the solution in, Excuse me, I'm having the same problem that um, you had yesterday. <coughs> so this is um, a device. Excuse me a second. I'm going to eat a cough drop. I hope if I can peel this stuff off. Maybe I can't. <laughs> so anyway, <coughs> this was given to us by IonSense, Brian Musselman. Uh, and we were able, uh, Vince was able to connect the XYZ stage to it. Fused silica goes into the inlet of the mass spectrometer. You can dip it into your sample and you can dip it into a wash solution. <clears throat> and now you can run <clears throat> samples like uh, this drug. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> and we're using a 9 femtomol per microliter uh, solution. And this is a single one-second acquisition. So we're consuming, uh, in this case, 150 femtomoles. We could get the same spectra with less resolution at uh, a tenth of a second. So in that case, you could claim you were uh, consuming only 15 atomoles. Excuse me. So that's the reason you want to have a solution or a matrix, is you can work at very low concentrations of sample, and you get a very nice ion current. Comparison of SAI, this solvent introduction inlet ionization with electrospray. Here's an example with insulin. You see the peaks with electrospray, the exact same instrument, the exact same concentration. The best we could do uh, at a flow rate, I believe, of 10 microliters a minute, and say I does better. Here's a, just to show you we can do proteins. This is myoglobin at a bit below a picomole per microliter solution. You can do things with this. Uh, you can make a liquid junction that was talked about yesterday, or you can just drop a drop of solvent onto something like an orange peel, suck it into the mass spec, and you get all the materials that are on the uh, orange peel, including uh, fungicides that they used. You can connect it to a liquid chromatograph. Very nice, uh, just like electrospray, except it's, uh, you really don't even need to a lot of the columns now come with fused silica uh, outlet here, and you don't need to change that. But you can. You put your own fused silica on. You don't have to worry about needle clogging. You're just using a piece of fused silica. You put that into the heated inlet tube, and you run your LC. And this is an example that we did in Sarah Trimpen's lab, and this shows one picomole. There are posters with uh, my students, and I think one of Sarah's students today, um, given... Uh, posters after this session, and you'll see that we get about the same results now with 100 femtomoles of sample loaded. So that's a BSA digest. Here's an example of uh, steroids that we ran um, by LCMS using a, na a Waters Nano Acuity, and I think it was done on the, this might have been done, uh, no, it, it was done on the Orbitrap, I believe. And so we have uh, a concentration study, and you get a nice linear range of concentrations with this technique. But what is interesting is that if you look at the sensitivity of this, this is SAI and this is ESI. <clears throat> at 5.4 femtomoles injected, you don't even observe it with electrospray, but you do with SAI. 
And you'll notice that it takes 10 times more material to get the same signal all the way up. And with a number of um, steroids, it's the same thing. SAI was more sensitive than ESI on the orbit trap instrument. So you can see you can get charges in a lot of ways, so I'm going to move over a little bit to talk a bit more in depth about the mechanism. And the question here, this was in science, as you will see down here, was uh, one of the things we have to find out is what's generating the charge. And so we believe that we're doing the same process as electrospray. We're making charge droplets. What's making the charge? Well, charges are easy to make in nature. And in 1938, Chapman talked about boiling water, making charges. The waterfalls can make charges. You see charges everywhere. And yesterday, uh, Vertiz was talking about scratching your, um, or, or getting electric charges on your suit or with a, a hammer or whatever. And so they're quite easy to make. And what we think is, and I think a lot of people, because it's been studied in thunderstorms, is that you have a charge on a surface between an air-water surface, for example. There is a charge on the surface uh, of the liquid. And if you have a rapid process that removes some of that surface, as in boiling, you can have a skin which will have the surface charge leaving the main droplet with the opposite charge. And when this bubble bursts, you will have tiny particles with the surface charge and the larger particle with the uh, opposite charge. So um, that pretty much says what I just said. We did some experiments to try to show this. We combinated the solution uh, that we put in into SAI. And if you do that, the standard non-combinated solution gave a certain ion current. And when we dipped the, thing, the uh, tube, the fused silica tube, into the solvent then, that's combinated, the ion current went up. And this is the total ion current, the singly, doubly, and triply charged ion of angiotensin 1. So all of those ions go up in the combinated, and you can see the mass spectra of this too. It actually improves ionization in electrospray, but not, not as much. So we could get improvements as much as 100x with this, but uh, sometimes not as much. So a lot of people have said, and uh, when we put in papers, Sarah's put in papers, and we have, and you get a lot of comments back and from the reviewers, and one we see a lot of is that you can make ions any way that mass spectrometers are so sensitive now that no matter how you do it, you would make ions. And in other words, what they're saying is this really isn't very important because ions are easy to make. But these ions could have been made back when electrospray was invented, and nobody's using any of the techniques. I don't know of anybody using a hammer, clapping their hands, uh, whatever, to make ions. And the reason they don't is because it's not convenient and it's not uh, sensitive to do this. SAI is not only simpler, actually, to operate and than ESI, it is more sensitive for many compound types. Even though the ionization efficiency in SAI is much lower than that in electrospray. And we think the reason is that in electrospray, you get dispersion losses. The spray is going out like this. Now, we're talking regular electrospray, not nano electrospray. You can improve electrospray with nano electrospray, but at a cost. And the cost is robustness and difficulty and time. You also have rim losses, where the ions going into the uh, atmosphere to vacuum uh, entrance are lost to the walls. And you don't have that with SAI because we go past that. We're making ions in the vacuum of the mass spectrometer. So we ask ourselves, what if we can make SAI more efficient, ion efficiently make ions anyway? And the idea was that we would put a voltage on. And it turns out that this isn't that easy. You have to put a voltage in a certain way or it doesn't work so well. But the way is to have a zero dead volume fitting and you put the voltage on it. Interestingly enough, we could put a voltage on a peak fitting or a metal fitting and it both worked. They both worked. So <clears throat> what we do is put a voltage here and when we do that, we can enhance the ionization. Now, in electrospray, we call this electrosprayed inlet ionization because the tube is now in the inlet, in the hot inlet. So in electrospray ionization, you need 
a fairly high voltage. But you don't need that high voltage to separate charge. You need that high voltage to produce the droplets of electrospray. Here we produce our tiny droplets because we're going into this heated inlet. We have the tube against the wall of the inlet. When the solution comes out, it goes and produces lots of droplets. So the droplets are produced by heat and the charge separation is produced by the voltage. And so even 75 volts will it produce a good enhancement. And it's very convenient that you can use almost any voltage. So here's an example of electrospray ionization um, in which we're using now, I think, angiotensin II. And we compare that with electrospray inland ionization. And you see, you get about a 30-fold. I don't know if you can read that in the back, but the difference in ion current is about 30-fold. So you get a 30-fold improvement. And we think that's because we now have good efficiency for ionization uh, as well as we don't have uh, dispersive losses. So here's an example of comparing it with SAI. Now, the SAI positioning is slightly different from the ESSII positioning. And so <clears throat> we had to have a compromise, but you get a compromise, the total ion current really doesn't change whether you turn the voltage on or off. But what does change, this is that mixture again of PEG and angiotensin II, um, is with SAI, it sees everything. It's not, the ionization is somewhat different from electrospray in the fact that it's more universal. The <clears throat> peptide is in this thing, but it's, it's embedded. When we turn the voltage on, it suppresses, as you can see, the PEG, increases the angiotensin. So it's a way to flip a voltage and see different things in your solution and at very high sensitivity. So where are we now? You don't need a nebulizing gas, you don't need a voltage, and I really do think this technique is so simple and so good that we're gonna see it come to a store near you soon, I hope. So this is where we are. This is on a Waters uh, Zevo TS, TQS, and it's using a seven femtomol per microliter solution of myoglobin, and this is SAI, and this is with the voltage on. That's a pretty good spectrum for just seven femtomoles per microliter. Now I'm gonna change gears a bit. I have a little more time and talk about um, this matrix that uh, Ellen Inyerton and Sarah Trimpin have reported on. This is a spectrum from them, of, I guess. No, maybe this is on our instrument, I don't know. It's ubiquitin. No, it's on their instrument, the Synapse G2. And they're using the magic matrix 3 nitrobenzyl nitrile. They don't have a laser, they don't have a voltage, they don't even apply heat, and they get this nice mass spectrum. So Sarah and I were talking about what could the mechanism of this be, and she came up with this um, picture, and it is of a water drop that's being frozen, and coming off that water drop, splintering ice particles. And this was reported in Science in 1970. Um, it uh, was reported in several different magazines, but the first one was Science in 1970. And you're seeing splintering of ice particles off of this water droplet. And this is off of uh, Cheng's uh, webpage, in which he shows that as you freeze the water droplet, stuff comes off. So we went back to the drawing boards and looked at this, and we're now using the same inlet device. We're putting in solution now, water, and if we heat this device, the inlet, and measure the uh, voltage down here, we see a positive voltage, as we saw before. If we measure the voltage on the inlet, we see a negative voltage. So <clears throat> what we're doing, a uh, uh, current, excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using voltage instead of current. So we see in a positive current and a negative current. So we know that on the surface of these water droplets from a lot of other studies is the surface is negatively charged, uh, the air water surface. And so what we measure here is the surface charge. And what we measure here is the uh, bulk charge. And so what we think happens is this device goes into the heated inlet and 
it can either hit the surface, like I said there, or it produces these bubbles with the droplets that are smaller, having negatively charged, and they uh, infuse into the walls of the inlet. Okay, going back, if we now freeze this inlet, like I just showed you with those droplets, we're putting, making this cold, we also see charges. And this then becomes negative, and that then becomes positive. So it reverses, the charge reverses, and that's kind of expected uh, from a thermal, a thermal ionization model. I, I won't go into that now, but the surface on a cold droplet is expected to be positively charged. And so we observe the surface here, and we observe the bulk there. If I can get rid of that, that's the cool one. And so this is the device that I showed you a little earlier. Now we have the inlet. It's room temperature that goes into the instrument. At room temperature, we get vir vir virtually no ions with a liquid, but we have an external inlet in which we can cool. And that's all we show in there, very cumbersome. But <clears throat> now if we take bradykine in a picomole per microliter and we introduce that into that cold inlet, we get ions. We don't get ions at room temperature, by the way, or close to room temperature, but cold or hot, we make ions, and that's a doubly charged ion of bradykinin. It's quite interesting that you can do this because we try to fragment this ion in the in-source fragmentation. We put a lot of voltage, it does not fragment. What happens is the intensity goes up, but it doesn't fragment. If we make it by electrospray or say I, and we try to fragment, it fragments easily. So what we think, we can fragment it, by the way, at the end of this orbit trap where you have an HCD cell, it has desolvated by then. We think that this ion is still encased in the solid or liquid solution at the point where we're trying to fragment it in the in-source fragmentation. So <clears throat> it, it gives you an idea. If we can make this technique good, analytically useful, you can now take a... Uh, uh, tissue sample and freeze it and make ions from it. And those ions could be encased as they go from the uh, atmospheric pressure region to the vacuum region in a solid. And so maybe you could do things like uh, complexes. But there is a problem. And the problem is shown here. We use methanol, we can do lysozyme. The reason we can't do it with water is water freezes too quickly and it freezes up the inlet right at the moment. But methanol doesn't, especially if you don't use the very coldest temperature, and you can get a uh, spectra of lysozyme with methanol. So the general mechanism for uh, ionization that we think is occurring is either an energy sudden process that removes uh, the surface charge, bubbling for example, or a splintering mechanism, uh, as uh, Sarah had indicated with the 3NBN three three matrix, and as was observed in 1970 by Chang. All right, so one other thing I'd like to mention, and uh, I was not given a lot of time to put this talk together, so I don't have any slides to show this, but <clears throat> in a thunderstorm, there are lots of charges that are made. People know that now. Uh, droplets have hundreds of charges, maybe even thousands of charges. Back in... 1970s, somebody we all know that have worked with electrospray instead of Erebon and Thompson, it was Thompson and Erebon. And what they did is considered that these droplets that are produced here, uh, that they could evaporate in the cloud, and if they evaporate, it would concentrate charges, and you might get ion evaporation. So they did a calculation, and they concluded that it was too much, uh, from the date of the day, there was too much... Uh, contamination in these droplets to allow ions to be made, but it's possible that you could, have, you could have the ion evaporation in which you get the smaller droplet with a lot of charge coming from the main droplet. <clears throat> so that was the gist of their paper, and we decided, since we can do this freezing and make ions in a similar way to what's expected they're made in these thunderstorms from ice particles, that maybe we should take some water from a thunderstorm, and we did that, we collected water, and we could electrospray it, we could make ions in, um, in the freezing method, and we could make ions in the SAI method, and interestingly enough, the ionization current was almost the same. 
So now you can consider something, and this is away from mass spectrometer, but there are places in these thunderstorms where there are updrafts and they become evaporative processes and these droplets be begin to evaporate. If they start spewing off the smaller, highly charged droplets and ions, they increase the conductivity of the air at that point because of the higher diffusion, and that could be a process that would initiate uh, lightning. So the process we use for mass spectrometry may be quite similar to what makes these uh, lightning bolts. And since the yellow light hasn't gone on yet, I'm going to mention atmospheric pressure solids analysis probe. It's a method where you simply put a compound onto a uh, melting point tube. You heat it with a gas stream from an APCI source or heated ESI source, vaporize the compound, ionize it with a discharge. Very simple. Solid probe introduction to atmospheric pressure ionization. Uh, here's a couple of examples of uh, this installed on, a, on different instruments. This is negative ion, and it's good for small molecules, very sensitive, uh, works very well. But it does not work for non-volatile compounds. If the compound's not volatile, it won't work. So we decided to take this matrix, this magic matrix that the Trimping Group came up with, three nitrobenzonitrile, and simply mix it with the sample, in this case lysozyme, in this case insulin, and put it on the melting point tube, stick it into the ion source of the Orbitrap instrument that we have, and heat it just slightly, 75 degree nitrogen gas. The inlet temperature is 200, but it works at 90. Um, and what do we get? We get very nice spectrum non-volatile compounds. This is another very simple way. It's not a vacuum. We think all the ions are made before it gets to the vacuum, interestingly enough. This compound is making ions from these proteins without doing anything. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> and here's an example of just taking spit and putting it on the melting point tube, and you can see a bunch of uh, proteins. In this case, it's pretty selective what it ionizes. It likes to ionize the peptides, proteins, and more basic compounds, the ones that are probably precharged in solution. All of the we's that I talked about were my group and Sarah Trimpin's group. Uh, this is a picture of us all in, uh, at the Denver ASMS meeting. And I would like to uh, thank NSF for support and the Rich and How. A Houghton Endowment for support at the University of the Sciences and for you taking the time to listen to me instead of Fred McLafferty. So thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to answer questions. Yeah, your cool inlet study. Yeah. Yeah, we, we really uh, haven't seen that, I don't think. Is Vince here? Do we see that? No, we've never been able to see water clusters on the orbit trap. Yeah, I, I think one of the reasons, I, I, this, is, uh, this is a total hypothesis. There's a Kelvin effect in which the smaller a droplet gets, the faster it evaporates. And it's possible that when you get down to very small uh, droplets, it evaporates so rapidly that you really don't see these clusters. And it may be the reason why electrospray works. I don't know. But that's a uh, kind of a outside idea. Other questions? Yeah, you can make it. If you really work at it, you can see them. But that may be because they're condensing rather than the other way around. What, it, oh, yeah, you can see. We're on a on a lysozyme? Yeah. Okay. We don't see it. We never see it. <laughs> yes? I guess I have the same same sort of question. Um, if you put those those frozen doubly charged solvated clusters into a trip tube, you would have a different probability. Yes.
tend to make these, uh, you tend to push the protein along the boundary layer where the, where the crystals form. And so if that's what's being released out of the fracture, then you would see an enrichment in the analog that you're looking for out of the crevice, if that's what you're doing. So if you do this multiple times, you'd expect to see a depletion. To see what? Oh, oh. If it's, if it's being enriched and then released, you melt it, if it's enriched again, if it's released. Do you see that sort of thing? No, we, what we've done so far is we're just introducing uh, a solution of water, say, into this inlet tube that's cold. And you only get one shot of introducing it and it freezes. <clears throat> um, and so we can see peptides, sorry, right, but it's difficult to see proteins that way. <clears throat> if you use methanol, on the other hand, it doesn't freeze and you can do it continuously so you can add up the signal. It's not a great signal yet. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering, are you seeing an enrichment because you're making these fractures that are enriched in the molecules? Don't know that and didn't think about it, but uh, Vince can think about it if he ever gets enough time to do this experiment again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.